full of outstanding and world-class vision and world-class this. I'm a real leadership geek, honestly. I've spent my whole career reading books and chatting to people. I just find the whole thing and the announcement, the way it's been announced, bizarre. If you could move away from a model where teachers are so intensely focused. Good morning, edgy folk. Happy Sunday and welcome to the weekly review. Today I've got an esteemed panel with me. I've got Maxine, I've got Leanne and I've got John. Good morning to you all. I hope you're all doing brilliantly today. We've got a lot on the agenda. We have got teacher workload, we have got teacher pay and we have got school holidays. So I think we should probably just get stuck in straight away, shouldn't we? So first on the agenda today, we have got... Uh, teacher workload. So we've got this um, results from a from a DfE survey. So let's have a look. School leaders and teachers are working longer hours, with full time leaders averaging fifty eight point two hours per week, and that is up from fifty seven point five hours in two thousand and twenty two. So fifty eight point two was in twenty twenty three, uh, and full time teachers' average hours are up to fifty two point four from fifty one point nine hours in twenty twenty two. Job satisfaction has declined massively with only 46% of teachers and leaders satisfied most of the time. That is down from 58%. I realise I'm throwing a lot of statistics at you here, but I think it's important to uh, put this uh, into context. Um, teachers and leaders increasingly feel undervalued by policymakers. No surprise there. With 90% uh, expressing a lack of appreciation and 71% disagreeing that school inspections provide a fair assessment of performance. Stress levels remain high, with 88% reporting work-related stress, which is up 2% on the previous year, um, and 73% feeling their job left insufficient time for personal lives. Now, I have thrown a lot of information at you there. Uh, Maxine, is any of that remotely shocking to you? Um, not surprising, um, but in, in other ways, very, very shocking. So there's there's a lot there, Lucy. And, uh, you know, there's a lot around that perception about not feeling valued, um, which which itself is a, you know, that's a whole show. That, that's a, a whole lot of discussion. I'm going to go um, just for the working hours one, actually, and the one about spending time with friends and family and the, the lack of time. So if, we, if we're working broadly a six hour, 60 hour week as school leaders, um, and, you know, school leaders are saying there's not enough time for friends and family and for their hobbies. Let's just go back to some really, really strong research that was published um, a while back in Harvard Business Review that, that said that, that leaders that took time away from work that didn't ruminate over work the night before were found to be more effective in their roles that they, they identified better as leaders and that people that they line managed and worked with saw that they were better as leaders in their role. Now, I think we can extrapolate that and make that the case for teachers as well as school leaders. If we take time to energise ourselves, to you know really take that well-being time, we're better at our jobs. Um, and if that's not possible, we can't. So it's not, you know, I think school leaders and teachers, they're not even in that ruminating place, you know, where they're thinking about work. They're in that place where they're still doing work. And so something needs to change. And that whole mantra for everything new that comes in, something else has got to go and there needs that change. It's not just for the well-being of school leaders and, and school teachers. It's actually so that they've got a sporting chance of, of being better in their job. And that's research backed. No, that's not just us saying that. that that's backed by really robust research. Mm, absolutely. And Leanne, I want to come to you and um, talk to you about job satisfaction. And it's uh, only 46% of teachers and leaders are satisfied most of the time. That's really quite sad. And how do you think we've, we've ended up here? Uh, I always kind of feel satisfied. I get like a warm tummy feeling when the lesson went well and when I think the kids have picked it up but I just think at the moment there seem to be a lot of schemes out there um, and I've been teaching for about 11 years and teaching from a scheme uh, strangely enough does not give me the warm gooey feeling in my tummy so that 
that to me, I, I don't I don't know how I feel about the schemes that are out there. And I know it's part of the reduced workload and reduced planning, but you know, especially nowadays, I think children and the variety of children has changed a lot. And when I trained, it was very much like almost like teach to each individual child. And I think that's more relevant now than it was when I started training even. And I think a lot of the re the workload reduction talks about planning and marking, but actually, I mean, I'm in year one, so the marking's not so heavy, but the, the workload for me is more the extra bits and the individualized prep you have to do and the resource making you have to do for that individualized teaching that to take more of my time than the planning and the marking. So I think that's changed a bit and maybe the view, the view on workload should change a bit about how to reduce it. Um, I also went down a rabbit hole when I started looking into the article. And Love the rabbit hole. The workload reduction task force, like there's a list of who's on it and their jobs. I think it's 14 people. Uh, one of them's a teacher. And that, I'm sure they were teachers before, possibly, but uh, yeah, one of them said class teacher. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I think you said you said a lot there, uh, Leanne, in 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 one, in one statement, and yes. I think that we um, that will get picked up on, and I think there'll be more more said on this, and that's very interesting. And John, I know I often pick on you from sort of more of an outside perspective, as um, you are a retired teacher. I am. I mean, this must be this must look. I mean, I'm sort of assuming, but this looks very different um, to maybe <coughs> where you started compared to now I mean how do you feel sort of almost as from the outside looking in as to what's happening to the profession that you were part of for a very long time well it is true that one of the delights the many delights of being retired is that you can look back on your career uh, and see the broad patterns and outlines and it was absolutely the case that workload went up valuation of teachers went down and so on. And that, that, that process is coming to is coming home to roost. We are seeing a culmination of years of a change in the attitude of our society to teachers. I mean, I, I was struck last night, I was watching a, I don't know, you've probably seen it, the advert that's going out on television at the moment about trying to recruit teachers. And it shows a teacher and excitingly in the playground, excitingly, this is the day you'll be challenged. This is the day you'll find wonderful things. This is the day where well, you should really show an ad, of course, is the teacher sitting quietly, just one long, about 35 minute ad of them sitting in a classroom, grinding through a pile of books as the sun goes down outside and said, this is what you'll do for lots and lots of time. Yeah, the work working is, is the, the, uh, what I can see is that teaching's careers has changed and like uh, Leanne I went down a rabbit hole and I explored this through well I came across a story from the Harris Academy and the Harris Academy the second biggest chain in this country a thousand of their teachers have signed an open letter submitted through the union complaining about the workload the intolerable workload at this apparently very successful uh, academy chain and the other part of that, I thought, it led me to thinking, well, yes, there you go. That's the that's the pressure. That's what they, they that's the new mantra these days. Grind down on the teachers, push the kids, push the students, push the teachers and so on. It's all about success and progress and so on. And that that atmosphere in schools, which was fun and exploration at the beginning of my career, turned into um, goal driven, target driven towards the end of my career. Another thing I noticed about the Harris Academy is they're director chief executive i should say chief executive 480,000 485,000 pounds a year salary in a non -for, non for profit uh, charitable organization which is what a charitable trust is now the, what is the, what's the connection here i mean is that just me going well you know that'd be nice to earn that amount of money or is it a thought that every increment that chap earns above a decent kind of executive salary say a hundred thousand a year every increment he earns which is about equivalent to an average teacher's salary is a statement a clear cultural statement of how little we value teachers and how much we value the executive you're you've been like leanne said you've been disempowered you're given your script go out on the playground it's not down to you the success of this school will be someone in an office somewhere sitting behind an executive boardroom type table earning a colossal amount of money, insulated by their income from any real fear of accountability. If it goes pear-shaped, who cares? You can retire on a good, a good pension. Teachers out there, on the other hand, who face the actual front line, 
know that they aren't the important ones. It's the guy in the boardroom, the guy in the, the, the chief executive and seven other Harris Academy leaders who earn above £190,000 a year. Good so great. paying yourselves colossal amounts of money, which is a straightforward statement. Teachers, yeah. you aren't important. You aren't Absolutely. the valued ones anymore. It's, um, I think there'll be um, yeah a, a lot more a lot more to, to to say on this, and it's clearly a, a topic of interest amongst amongst this panel as well. So uh, watch this space. I'm sure more to be said. Right, moving on to talk about teacher pay. So the government, Gillian Keegan, uh, has urged uh, the school teachers review body, the STRB, to bring teacher pay awards back to a more sustainable level, is the quote, um, for the upcoming financial year. Um, so to kind of bring it, bring them to sort of what she feels. Well, I don't think she even really knows what she means, but we'll come back to that. Uh, suggesting a budget headroom of 1.2% or 600 million. The DfE expressed concern over the impact of pay rises on school budgets and highlighted a 12% increase in teachers' average pay over the last two years, with starting salaries up by 17%. Um, the DfE claimed that the uh, economic context has stabilised, um, that inflation has in fact decreased and wage growth is easing, uh, supporting their view that teacher pay awards should return to a more sustainable level. Um, Pay rise rose by 5% in 2022 and 6.5% the following year, and this was deemed appropriate by the government, but they now feel that there needs to be more of a careful balance. Um, and uh, the government has asked the STRB to consider potential benefits of targeted remuneration by subject, especially for STEM teachers, acknowledging challenges in recruiting and retaining them in a competitive market. Now, uh, John, coming to you first on this, how do you um, feel? Do you feel these justifications are uh, fair? John, you need to unmute yourself, please. I'm muted by that. I'm just there. Here we are. <laughs> now I'm live. Right, okay. So I'm all, all governments I'm back. All governments have to, you know, that's the purpose of government is a, is about priority. And of course, you know, you say, well, we can afford this and we can't afford that. But priorities are about, well, what you think is important in a society. And in our society, education, we are, we, we know, is increasingly the stuff of our success. And we, it's highly important in our society. Highly create, we are a creative economy, we're a service economy. Our resources aren't under the ground anymore. We don't dig stuff up and turn it into things. What we do is we have our people. And so if you're going to invest in anything, invest in education. So when, when a government says something like uh, we, we can't afford this particular pay rise, they will use another phrase and teachers unions will use it as well. Fully funded. They'll say, well, this, this should be fully funded and so on. What's been happening for years now is that the statement fully funded tends to mean at least some of this will fall heavily on some schools rather than others. So every time a teacher gets a pay rise, there must be a bittersweet feeling that somewhere there'll be schools whose budgets are going to be cut as a result. Because even though it might be fully funded here and fully funded there, it, the, the funding of schools isn't evenly distributed and the effects is uneven. So that, that many areas, particularly poorer areas, pay rises for teachers do mean loss of resources for schools. And that is a way in which, in a sense, teachers are punished for asking for more money. As a society, we need to work, work, say, this is a priority for us, something we can afford. Absolutely. And Leanne, coming to you, your thoughts on, <clears throat> excuse me, your thoughts on uh, on Gillian Keegan's comments. About, they talk about giving more money to specific subjects, um, specifically to the STEM subjects. And I think about a year ago, I think maybe we talked about it on the, the weekly review of giving more, money to, <laughs> giving more money or a bigger raise to NQTs and not experienced teachers and it just all seems to be about enticing teachers into the profession but I mean I don't know is my if money is the way to entice teachers in and then I think to myself like you know is, is a reception teacher gonna end up getting less than a physics teacher in high school like who makes the decision of which subjects are need more like specific recruitment which subjects are more important because I uh, guess we want more people in STEM subjects, in STEM kind of jobs, 
but a reception teacher teaches a child how to read. So like who makes the decision of what is more important? And I mean, I think that, I mean, I went from business into teaching and I think that if I had the STEM skills, would I want to teach or would I want to be in industry? So maybe they need to make a, a bridge between industry and teaching as you do. I think you get a lot of that in higher education where lecturers are also in business and you would want to learn from somebody like that. So they need people from business to bridge into teaching, to kind of straddle both industries. I think that's maybe a better way to look at it than to like pull them away from industry. Um, I think you want industry leaders teaching those subjects, really. Absolutely, and I think that's a, a very interesting. And one of you, your thoughts on this? Yeah, there are three things really for me on this. First, the whole um, sustainable level. What 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 is more sustainable level? And that links to that links to school funding, doesn't it? Um, one or two percent rise when we've still got inflation at four percent and we've had behind inflation rises since 2010 apart from the last couple of years you know admittedly that uh, puts that whole that whole sort of context of people say not being in line with, with other jobs in terms of how that, that's risen just picking up on what what leanne said as well there about primary school teachers so yeah there is a push to um attract people into the profession which is great and I celebrate you know it's part of the work that I do to, to encourage new trainees and it, it's really important so we have bursaries for STEM subjects for secondary MFL there's no bursary for primary and if we have no if you know if we do this differential between pay and we pay secondary STEM different to our wonderful primary practitioners you know I entered the profession as a secondary teacher and over the last 25 years, my respect for um, early years teachers, key stage one, key stage two, has just gone through the roof. We, we can't forget this because the messages that children get about who they are and what they can achieve, they're really formed by the ages of seven or eight. And their early reading, they can be on catch up for the rest of their lives if they've not got those excellent practitioners. So. They're, they're two out of the three things for me that I think are really, really important. Uh, fantastic. Um, before we move on, I just want to remind you that this show is in fact sponsored by John Cat Educational. We have had them with us for a long, long time now, and they are still offering us a lovely discount, which you can see at the bottom of the screen there, for 20% off all books from the John Cat Bookshop. And the discount code is JCTTR2324. There is a wide, wide catalogue of books available to you. So if you would like to treat yourself and uh, improve your CPD, please go and have a look. I mean, I couldn't even begin to tell you the variety of things that are there for you to have a look at. So do make use of that discount. Um, once again, it is JCTTR2324. Have a look on johncatbookshop.com and treat yourself to some new books. Okay, we are now going to move on. And I think this one's gonna be really interesting to talk about school holidays. Now, of course, we know as teachers that and we often get told, well, you know, you don't you don't need to worry. You don't need to complain. You get loads of time off. So let's see what your thoughts are on this. So a report from the Nuffield Foundation suggests that England should reform its school calendar and reduce the summer holidays from six weeks. And bear in mind that we're talking about the state system to four weeks and extending autumn and winter half term breaks from one to two weeks each. The proposed changes aim to improve the well-being of pupils and teachers, uh, balance childcare costs for parents, uh, potentially enhance academic results, um, and address educational divides that were exacerbated by the time the children spent at home during the pandemic. Um, the report says that um, this will also uh, counter learning loss, particularly for students from disadvantaged backgrounds who sometimes struggle to resume learning after lengthy summer breaks, which I always think is a bit of a, is, I do think that's a bit of a weird thing to say. I struggle to remember how to teach. So <laughs> to, the idea that there's a particular group that struggled to come back, maybe they, maybe they do. But yeah, I certainly, those first few lessons back after the summer, I'm definitely standing there going, do I remember how to do this? I don't know about you. Um, 
The call for calendar changes aligns with proposals from the Welsh Government, uh, which plans to start adjustments for the school year starting 2025-26, uh, uh, to include a shorter summer break and longer autumn half terms. Um, some schools in England have been experimenting with this, um, but 33% uh, are currently in favour of a six-week break, 35% preferring five, and 29% advocating for a reduction to four weeks. Leanne, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Do you enjoy a long summer or do you think that uh, our um, holidays need to be more evenly distributed in inverted commas? Uh, yeah, yes, I enjoy the summer holidays. <laughs> I, I teach five-year-olds. <laughs> I was going to say, um, a silly question, really, isn't it? Um, it's six weeks at the moment, I would say, and you'd probably be hard-pressed to find teachers that don't, use some of that time to work um to set up for the next year i usually don't go into the end of the holidays i know some teachers don't um but usually the last week of the holidays i might yeah you're smoking yeah yeah i might pop in for a couple of days and if i'm not in i'm probably at home planning re-planning uh thinking even if i'm not sitting planning or not in school I'm still thinking of like, this went well, I should change that. I'm gonna do that. I need to move that cupboard to there because of this. So you're giving us four weeks. Actually, it's probably more like three weeks because I, I would spend time thinking about it, probably doing some work, um, planning for the first week. Cause I know myself by like the last week of the year, that last PPA slot, I'm like, I, just, I don't wanna plan for September. I wanna like, let me do something else. Like I'll back a board, you know, or I'll go set the classroom up for September instead of planning. So you're taking weeks away, but we actually need them to plan and to actually, I don't know, to decompress almost. So I think they, they take from here and they take here and they put there with pay, with um, workload, with holidays. It doesn't seem to change it. It just moves things around. Absolutely. Um, Maxine, coming to you. So I think there are some real positives with this. Um, and I know this is coming as somebody who's no longer full time in the classroom. Um, but that does come with the, the same concerns that Leanne's raised. So let me explain. So first of all, we all know that when we've got to the end of one of those terms that's not been six weeks, it's been seven and a half. That's really difficult. Um, we know that planning is better if we're planning in regular five or six week blocks, however it, it works out. And, and Leah, Lee Elliott Major, who's one of the authors of this arc, of this um, discussion, who's one of the proponents for this, who writes, you know, is professor um, in University of Exeter around social mobility. He's really super knowledgeable. And again, he's the author of one of our John Cat books, isn't he? he and it's, it's really, really good stuff. And it's, it's really strong. But I think it also takes somebody who is actually in the classroom or, or in school um, leadership. And yeah, he's been, he's been a regular on Teacher Talk Radio as well, um, Professor Lee Elliott Major. Really, you know, really super knowledgeable guy. It does also take somebody who has got school leadership experience, a teaching experience, because there are, there are two things about that six week break. One, it's magical. And it is a thing that is pretty unique to teaching. You know, we are some teachers who enjoy taking that period of travel that you couldn't do in other jobs. And, you know, not just teachers, actually, but our support staff, who that's a real draw um, to, to do that. But also that whole thing around coming in for exams, around that being a time when we plan, when there's, you know, development plan work for school leaders, we need to change some of that if we're going to then take that six week away. So in short, real positive strength in principle, but it does take some more thinking about, about how that's actually going to work on the ground. Absolutely. And, and then, Thank you. Um, and John, just a, a brief comment from you. Of course, I know this doesn't impact you in the, in the same way anymore, but your thoughts? Yes, every day is a holiday for me now. <laughs> the, I, the, um, <laughs> I thought that was a bit too cheap. No, neatly. I mean, it was perfectly uh, described by Leanne and Maxine there. The the, the the debate. You know, you can see there are. It's it's, it's on both sides. I, I've heard this debate many times before. The the reason for the long summer holidays is a historical accident, really. 
but it is it is a unique thing. I take Maxine's point there, and it's particularly for children. I can remember that experience when you were all in young childhood. And you wake up and you think it's a beginning of the summer holidays. What a wonderful experience for teachers as well as students. I would pay, I had one brief comment though, and that is that the why are we asking this and what this question? Why does it pop up every now and again? Because we imagine we we see that the six week break or the ten week break or the long summer break, whatever it is in America, it's going to be twelve weeks. People you lose, students will lose some of their knowledge or some of their socialization for schools. Well, that's because we have an overly knowledge based content. We cram too much in schools. We're preparing towards exams. Of course, students preparing for exams are going to come back having forgotten the equations for this and forgotten the formulas, forgotten the dates for this and that and so on. Of course, but if we had a different sort of education system, more playful, more fun, more enjoyable, less crammed with knowledge and less exam and outcomes driven, then some of these things wouldn't matter so much and wouldn't be so consequential for the poorer members of our society. The failure of exams is a failure that is going to carry them into life. And that's what Lee Elliott Major is worried about. He says, look, you're failing students in a particular group. And we are. We're condemning quite a lot of students to failure. Well, fix the schools, don't fix the holidays. I'm going to jump in briefly here and defend um, Europe's um, long holidays because European schools in general have, they tend to finish towards the end of June or very early July. But these countries are geared to it. All around Portugal, where I where I live, you see groups of students being taken out by um, or groups of young kids from varying ages. They are on little camps. They are on... Um, little adventures they have got and of course there this has to be staffed and all the rest of it but um there are sort of discounts and things available to parents um or the cost is quite low it's almost just an expectation these kids are catered catered for um in a way that just doesn't exist uh in the uk and i think um this exists in the us as well not kind of maybe as widely as it once used to but kids go off on camps and things like that so takes the pressure off those parents a little bit um but i've never sort of been aware of things like that in the uk so again maybe that's something to look into but just my two cents on on that my, my, my cousins in america go on very long camps in the summer holidays and they say in the report that there's behavior issues after the long summer break i mean i don't have behavior issues but when they come back from any holiday you have to train them a little bit back into a routine. That's not just because it's a six week summer holiday after a one week half term. It's the same. So and like the behavior issues is a wider community challenge that maybe like you say in Europe and in America, they're on those camps. And so they are still being taught behavior and like routines. That's the like you say, that's the difference between the UK and Europe and America where they have those big camps. Yeah. I think that's I agree. There's maybe a TTR show in there potentially. So, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, we are going to move on and do our shows of the week. Okay, there have been some fantastic shows on Teachers Talk Radio this week, as there are every week. So, I am going to pick on you, John, first this week. Well, I'm going to recommend uh, Chris uh, Val's show on the 27th of February, the late show, in which he uh, and a couple of academics uh, interviewed about their approach to a teaching a course on feminism in higher education. And you think, well, that's very interesting about that. And I thought, well, it is interesting. It is fascinating because what they were confronting was how you talk about these ideas in our society. It shouldn't be that, that that's a difficult thing at all. And then almost as I what, listened to this show, there was an article in the, in the Telegraph that said um, m a majority of people in Britain think that in it, equality for women has gone too far. Whatever that means. A, I don't believe it for a minute. It's the kind of telegraphic uh, survey that generates an answer they were looking for in the first place. But if that were true and a majority of people thought equality had gone too far, clearly that's the reason why we need to talk about feminism. <laughs> that's exactly why we need to talk about it. So we love the show. And thank you for advocating for that one, John. Great stuff. Uh, Maxine, coming to you. Yeah, Lucy, it was um, your show, How to Teach Spelling Effectively with uh, Robert Martin from The Spelling Shed. So two things, really. I loved all the preamble chat around yeah. it. And I, I loved that there was some discussion around ent entomology and around the teaching of spelling. I really feel that I needed to have known about The Spelling Shed earlier because it's not something new, is it? 
Uh, no. It, no. It, it, um, it's it, been around look, for a good while. Yeah, and it's such a great programme. For me, going back to childhood me, it takes away all that horrible spelling testing. So I, I've been advocating this to, to lots of people, that, lots of schools that I work with. So thank you, Lucy. Love that well, preamble. Thank you. Thank you to, to Robin Martin, who were fabulous to talk to. And uh, that show is, well, all these shows are available to listen back to. Leanne, coming to you. Uh, mine was Sean McKay's was the Late Late Show about uh, writing creatively where he interviewed Sally Doherty about the writing process. Um, I, I like to take a few things from those kind of shows that I can put into my classroom. So the first thing I noted was she was like, use the outdoors to so take the kids outside. What do they notice? All the objects and like, you know, use those in a story. Let them use what they see in a story. And I, I love that. Um, and then uh, probably more for older kids, but allow them freedom to let characters grow as they write. I think we're, we're very time constrained in schools with writing processes. So, you know, that's a constant challenge. It's how do you give them the freedom when you don't have the time? Um, and then she talked about something called an inciting incident. Uh, I've never heard of it before, but it's apparently the moment of change when characters' worlds change and they are plunged into a story. So I really like that aspect of it. That's lovely. And that's definitely on my to, to listen back list. I haven't quite got that far yet. And finally, for me, it's um, Tom's two-parter from Wednesday, I believe. So the first part was about uh, phonics in secondary school, which was actually a lovely follow-on from having talked to um, uh, Spelling Shed guys. And um, he talked to Adam um, Levick, I'm just making sure I get the names right, and Charlie Duckett, uh, and um, how the impact of the pandemic has meant that more children are arriving in secondary um, without uh, that sort of phonic space for whatever that reason that is whether it's um children with additional needs or children who have an eal background and um, so that was absolutely fascinating because of course um i'm in my head thinking okay you know phonics doesn't really extend beyond those early years of primary but for some children moving on into secondary those uh, interventions are still absolutely necessary um and then the second part um was uh, Dave Brown was invited on to chat about uh, cutting down workload when marking for essay subjects, which uh, is uh, really interesting because, of course, in subjects like history, politics, English, all of these things at GCSE, at A-level, even kind of going through secondary school, children are writing very kind of long, sort of detailed assignments. And uh, I wouldn't even begin to know where to start with uh, how to how to mark something like that. So that was uh, interesting to sort of see the different approaches and hear about how uh, that's uh, that's tackled. So uh, a really, really worth uh, listening back to. Right. We've done a lot, as always. So that's been uh, fantastic. Um, Thank you for listening. As always, thank you for tuning in uh, via whichever platform you have chosen. Uh, a reminder that we do this every week. Um, looking forward to next week. And I think this is Monday's uh, Twilight Show tomorrow with um, lovely Nathan Ginn. He is interviewing Naomi Fisher, which uh, promises to be a, a very interesting um very interesting discussion. Um, I know that uh, there's going to be um, some lots of different thoughts and uh, opinions circulating in that one. So well worth tuning in. Uh, yeah, you can see it at the bottom there. So on spaces. Oh, it's not Twilight. It's the late show. It'll be 7.30. I beg your pardon. Uh, so that is um, definitely on my list to look into. And uh, we'll probably make it into a show of the week next week for somebody as well. Um, just a reminder once again that our lovely uh, John Cat discount is still available. You can see it at the bottom of the screen again there, JCTTR2324. Still giving you 20% off all the books uh, in the John Cat catalogue from johncatbookshop.com. So please don't do go. Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Please do go and have a look at those as well. Panel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, John. A pleasure as always to have you with me. And uh, we will do this all again next week. full of outstanding and world-class vision and world-class this i'm a real leadership geek honestly i've spent my whole career reading books and chatting to people i just find the whole thing and the announcement the way it's been announced bizarre if you could move away from a model where teachers are so intensely focused